uh, yes, yeah, uh, kind of not so much um, a personal research project, but it's it's about book project that I uh, am at the moment uh, doing with my colleague Scott Simpson, uh, a book about Slavic paganism in mm -hmm. a socialist state. Um, and uh, it is a kind of continuation for a book that we did uh, almost 10 years ago about paganism in Central and Eastern Europe. And now with a, a little bit more narrow focus, uh, Scott is covering uh, pretty much all the other countries. I'm focusing on, on Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus, and that, that is the kind of area that I mostly focus on. So in this, this presentation, uh, but also because after I send you the title, I began to think that this, this is crazy. It's going to be it's going to be a very kind of superficial going through such a huge uh, space and and time and so on. So I tried to come up with some kind of angle, and then uh, it came to me uh, because especially because after the war started in Ukraine, one of the kind of topical discussions in our field has been uh, post-colonial approach. So I, I thought about kind of uh, using my own thoughts and, and this discussion that has been conducted and concerning paganism, I think this is really relevant. And, and the kind of questions that I have been thinking is, is partly also about kind of uh, dichotomy or doing the, the research between uh, colonialism and nationalism. So, yeah. mm -hmm. okay, so uh, I, I think that this uh, question about post-colonialism uh, in regards to the uh, study of paganism is actually quite relevant in, in many different ways. Uh, first of all, if, if we look at the pagan studies in general as a kind of international uh, field of inquiry, there is uh, quite often you encounter this division between Western and Eastern paganism and this really simplistic idea of uh, uh, Western paganism being inclusive, liberal, and so on, well, Eastern paganism or paganism in, in the Eastern Europe and Russia as nationalist, intolerant, aggressive, and so on. And uh, to a certain extent, this is, of course, true because these right wing groups and nationalism is more prevalent in, in the Eastern Europe and Russia, but, but it's, it's not the whole truth, and actually, they are in. in in Russia and Eastern European countries, though I apologize for using this term Eastern Europe, it is kind of uh, just for convenience, but that's very controversial too. Uh, there are groups that are not uh, engaged in, in this kind of ultra nationalist rightist politics. And uh, there are different groups between countries, like for example, in Czech Republic, uh, these kind of nationalist groups are are not dominating and they are actually uh, quite more these kind of liberal pagan uh, groupings. Um, and then, of course, constructing this East, uh, that uh, post socialist space is often still regarded as a kind of dividing from the Western Europe. And if you think about Russian, Eastern European, Eurasian studies, there are these continuous debates about what is Eastern Europe, what is Central Europe how these countries define themselves and how they are often still put in the same category of, of this uh, post-socialist space. Uh, but then uh, I think that in, also in the study of, of uh, paganism in Russia, in Russia, Eastern Europe, Central Europe, like in our book, there is still this kind of cultural that if there is a kind of uh, portrayals of paganism, uh, in this area, it always starts from Russia. Russia is a kind of thing, uh, area that's first discussed. Uh, and later, I will uh, also talk about the, the kind of post colonial experiences in these areas in other part, uh, countries than Russia. But uh, a final point is that has also been raised in, in, in the scholarly discussions in this spring, and for example, Karen Strength uh, approach in Facebook about how she has been uh, lecturing about post colonial approach and, and discussing with her students about how to avoid this kind of methodological nationalism when we are in the post colonial uh, approach. And I, I think that is also quite uh, a relevant uh, question. And hope, hope I will uh, bring some viewpoints to that question as well. But 
very strong with this history of contemporary Islamic paganism. Uh, I think that it's good to start from this 19th century romanticism and nationalism. And of course, again, the uh, history differs in different areas. Uh, in many countries, like for example, Poland or Belarusia, there were uh, attempts to construct this national identity, like in, in basically all European countries, of, of course, uh, a little bit different times. Uh, and in the construction of our national identity, our national history, uh, paganism often emerged. Uh, though, of course, often it was not necessarily paganism as a religious uh, identity, though even there, there were some exceptions, like, for example, uh, Tchaikovsky in Poland, who was this kind of flamboyant figure who, who did identify himself as, as pagan. Uh, but uh, constructing this national identity, there were also construction of Slavic identity, what that means. And Ron Hudson has written about different perceptions of, uh, of uh, paganism in Europe in general and mostly in Western Europe and, and talked about different representations <laughs> like noble savage or, or this classic uh, uh, paganism and so on. Um, and also about Slavic identity that included Slavic paganism. There are I mean, Herder's idea of, of Slavic uh, identity, it was very influential, and his portrayal of it was, was kind of peaceful, uh, hospitable, generous, but also the kind of peasant image of Slavic, Slavic identity. But there were also other uh, representations, like uh, more connected to heroism and warrior image, and so on. Uh, the, Next stage is perhaps the uh, beginning of the 20th century, and especially the interval period, where there were uh, in some countries these small pagan groupings. Uh, some of them uh, were also connected to, to kind of uh, national socialism, uh, similar to Germany. Uh, perhaps it was more uh, in Baltic countries than in, uh, in Slavic areas, but for example, in Poland, there was. Zadruga movement, Zadruga publication. Uh, majority of these were quite marginal, and of course, after the Second World War, these were suppressed, and uh, uh, even in the areas that did not fail under communist rule, uh, they were kind of bankrupt after the Second World War. Uh, if we talk about Soviet representations of paganism, uh, Stella Rock has written a, a fascinating book about the uh, uh, discourse with the, um, the concept of Bayeveria and how Soviet power actually kind of consciously tried to uh, emphasize the role of paganism in the history of, of Russia. And in this way, instead of portraying this as Christian tradition, as folk tradition connected to paganism. And uh, if you look at uh, contemporary paganism, especially in Russia, you can see these Soviet images, how they have molded the way that paganism is uh, uh, depicted and understood. Like Maris um, Lukakov is, of course, very influential thesis, but main source for many of the groups. But even uh, Soviet films, like, like for example, Rus is not Chalmea, you can still see many, many uh, images different from, from that kind of. Uh, popular culture, but also uh, these narratives, like for example, uh, in, in this book, is not Chalmaya, uh, uh, Slavic pagans are, are, are depicted as democratic, free loving, uh, uh, generous, whereas Byzantine and in this way Christianity is kind of, they are slavery and they are uh, kind of, uh, also the political system is more corrupt. So this, I, this idea also has an impact on contemporary paganism. Uh, especially for Ukrainian paganism, diaspora communities had a huge impact uh, and through Ukraine, also in other areas. Because for example, in Poland and in many other countries, actually the Ukrainian paganism has, has had more impact than the Russia. Um, uh, the, the kind of pagan movements in uh, 
in uh, Europe and especially in the North America uh, was basically uh, founded or the grand old man of that movement is Volodymyr Shaya and later his uh, students, uh, Lexilenko, uh, created a competing uh, organization. So these are the, the two figures that had a huge impact both in these African communities, uh, especially in Canada, partly also in the United States, and then also in uh, Ukraine after the collapse of communism. Uh, and they are from diaspora communities, of course, then also the Book of Veles, this manuscript that they alleged to be the ancient manuscript, but it is apparently a forgery. But uh, until uh, today, it has remained as a kind of very influential, almost a sacred book, even though I would say that its uh, impact is uh, decreasing. Uh, so, and, and then Soviet counterculture, especially the uh, fascina fascination with the East, uh, this Indian connection that had impact on con uh, the formation of, of uh, contemporary Slavic paganism. And you can still, still see this. Uh, Attempts to combine kind of Vedic literature and argue that, that this is the our tradition. Uh, well, of course, the collapse of the Soviet Union really kind of uh, allowed these movements to uh, come public <coughs> and, and grow uh, and recruit or spread the, the uh, message openly. Uh, so some scholars actually argue that the start of Slavic ethnic paganism in, so, uh, in today's Russia started only in the 1990s. But uh, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, also these international pagan communities have, have had their impact, even though, uh, for example, Russian pagans do not have that much, they do have increasing contacts with international pagan organizations, like pagan federation and so on. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this international community also functions as a kind of uh, way that they can reflect their own, own identity and this way uh, engage in dialogue. But the difficulty in, uh, in talking about Slavic paganism is, is first of all kind of uh, demarcating or defining the movement and this is something that, that, uh, that is, is, is truly a challenge for us all because First of all, there are so many different movements or phenomena that are somewhat, somehow connected to paganism. Some groupings may use some pagan imagery or, or uh, parts, uh, elements from paganism, but are not identifying themselves as pagans. Starting from uh, neo Nazi uh, groupings that may use kind of uh, talk about pagan gods or something like that. Like that but they are not necessarily kind of pagan uh, in, in, in the sense that they would have some rituals or practice the religion or anything like that. Um, but then there are also uh, these internal debates, and there are many different kind of statements published by organizations or umbrella organizations or grouping of organizations that these groups cannot be considered as pagan. So, <laughs> for example, uh, a organization that Sierkovstar, we are in lingua, from Slavic in lingua. Sorry, <laughs> such a long, long name that I forgot that the uh, kind of English is a very, very syncretic group uh, originating from Oms that was actually quite influential uh, also between pagans in 2000s, uh, but had a very kind of wild historical claims and, and indeed very syncretic teachings. Uh, they are many pagan organizations nowadays are, are kind of very uh, reacting very strongly if in scholarly studies these groups is counted as one of the belonging to the pagan movement so a scholar have to take into account uh, these internal debates but uh, since the 1990s there are many different kind of organizations uh, the, I would argue that the majority of them are very informal, short living. So it's very difficult to, to uh, detect these and study these. And that is one of the reasons why it's very, very difficult to estimate the number of pagans in, in any country, especially uh, in such a large, large country as Russia. 
But then there are more formal organizations that have, for example, uh, web pages and advertise their activities. And there are umbrella organizations, like in Russia, for example, uh, the Slavic Union of Slavic Communities of Slavic Native States. Uh, the circle of pagan tradition, which is now very small or marginal, has become quite marginal, uh, and so on, from uh, the and so on. Um, and then there are international organizations. Uh, the picture uh, on top is, is Radavoy Slovenska page, which, which gathers uh, annually uh, until uh, the middle of the 2010s, obviously not anymore in this situation. You can see there is Pavel Kulai from Petersburg, Halina Lusko from Ukraine, but in Katakov from Russia, and uh, Sachinko is from uh, Belarus. Uh, but then there are transnational communities, uh, like <coughs> this picture that, where people are sitting. It's Tadavoya Ovnisha. Uh, it's a uh, organization uh, founded by uh, Kurovsky and, and his uh, former wife, uh, and it has activities in Ukraine, uh, in Russia, uh, the web pages are in both languages, it actually have, has, has, has had communities in Belarus and Germany, because when I looked at the web page uh, this spring, uh, obviously the Ukrainian uh, websites were not functioning anymore, and, Actually, even after 2014, he was criticized in Ukraine for it, so that he was not condemning the, the annexation of Crimea strongly enough. And actually, uh, looking at his social media, he hasn't even condemned the war explicitly. So, so it's it's kind of tragical how these transnational communities have is also been affected by by the war. But then there are informal online communities and. Uh, these are especially important for solitary practitioners because not all the pagans uh, are belonging or in any com community, so even participating in their activities. <clears throat> and it has had huge, huge impact in the emergence of these movements. Uh, if you look at the online discussions, many people there say that uh, that's mm, in the internet, they found out that they were not the only ones, but there was a huge mm -hmm. community. And, and that's actually uh, a movement from Russia uh, started by Gennady Adamovich, which has a kind of martial art, Slavic martial arts teaching, but also a teaching about Slavic enchantress, which is, has found followers yeah. in Russia. And this is an article about Poland, about Polish followers of this kind of practitioners of this, this gymnastic. And then a big debate that I would have liked to go into the terms because there is a term that everyone accepts. Paganism is considered as the derogatory label used by Christians. Some use nature religion, but it's quite wide. Uh, vegan does not necessarily refer specifically to paganism. And then there are different uh, versions of this native faith. Uh, but others argue that it's artificial innovation. Uh, invented and used by in some countries it's considered as a kind of Russian invention. Uh, question or the debates about is it religion, faith, worldview or philosophy. Uh, and this of course has also the political connotations because uh, especially in such authoritarian states as Russia, it may be easier to kind of try to stay under the ra radar not advertising it as a religion that's kind of that's traditional or something like that. So uh, there are there is no any one uh, form or organ even organization or there's no generally agreed uh, authority organizations, holy scriptures or anything. So there is ongoing debates about what is pagan, what is our tradition, and so on. Uh, I have collected here some of the most uh, kind of biggest discussions. This uh, debate about uh, is paganism a monotheistic, polytheistic, or perhaps henotheist or pantheist uh, tradition is especially has been especially uh, uh, important in Ukraine, where uh, Shayan was was a polytheist and or actually kind of 
penalty because she's considered as that of these cards are fundamentally manifestation of justice. Or and Silenko who who uh, subscribe to monotheism. Uh, the Soviet tradition, perhaps not so much in Russia, but for example in Belarus, there are discussions about this current understanding and scholarly study of paganism, how much it actually reflects the Soviet uh, interpretation and therefore is not uh, usable, it's uh, perverted or uh, corrupted version of uh, tradition. Uh, and then the big discussion in this, the all countries is there uh, should contemporary paganism try to recreate ancient paganism uh, practices as faithfully as possible, or <coughs> can this be seen only as a kind of inspiration that are changed and, and developed uh, to suit modern words? Relevant sources uh, is it uh, archaeological findings or uh, is it uh, ethnographic uh, material, folklore? Uh, there, there are some communities of leaders who argue that they have received the tradition from some family tradition, uh, or is it some kind of intuition with, with uh, the tradition of, of the ancestors? Uh, the history, as, as I already mentioned, there are these really wide uh, historical claims about uh, different races or the ancestors of Slavs coming from the different stars uh, that uh, the majority of pagans seem to now that it kind of uh, discredit and, and be most kind of embarrassed about these theories uh, and conspiracy theories also uh, and, and uh, to be honest actually these, these kind of groupings have had a Quite negative impact on how paganism is uh, portrayed or perceived in public, for example, in Russia. Nationalism, uh, at the beginning of 2000s, there was a huge divide in, in, within Russian pagans uh, about after one umbrella organization denounced nationalism or, as they said, uh, national chauvinism. Uh, but similar division can actually see, be seen in the majority of European ethnic paganisms. So in many countries, in Nordic countries, in Greece, in many other countries, some pagan organizations have made statements that nationalism and intolerance cannot be considered as part of um, paganism. In Russian and these East European countries, there hasn't been such a huge the public statement in, in recent years, but there is this divide, and especially in internal discussions, uh, the topic is, is often, uh, you can find it there, like for example, in that community, there are neo-Nazis participating and, and so on. And in some communities, uh, I think this is kind of recent trend, there is a rule that uh, politics should not be discussed in the meeting in that way, kind of trying to avoid these confrontations, even though I must say that the way the politics is understood uh, is can be quite narrow. So in, in communities that say that politics cannot be, that should not be, uh, is not allowed to be discussed in our meetings. From my perspective, they are still talking about politics and, and, and nationalistic politics too. Uh, magic, uh, is magic part of, of uh, Slavic pagan tradition is a huge discussion and, and something that, that's uh, a little bit uh, differs from, from the Western paganism where magic is often quite central uh, to the self uh, identity. And then indeed, this uh, who can be uh, considered as pagan. So there are so many different representations of uh, Slavic paganism. Uh, in similar way as in these uh, 19th century representations of paganism or of Slavic identity. Uh, so there are these quite military, uh, nationalistic organizations, and on the other hand, organizations that are more focused on, on this uh, esoteric teachings, the connection with nature, rituals, and so on. Uh, and if we talk about uh, the image of contemporary Slavic paganism and, and how people find it, 
uh, two things that cannot cannot be cohesive is uh, life rolling or recon reconstructionist movements or a hobby uh, that many people find Platonism through that and uh, metal music, uh, which is also uh, a way for many to enter Platonism. And the band uh, in the picture is God's Tower from Belarusia. Uh, actually, it's uh, one of its members is now got a sentence a couple of years ago for insulting uh, an uh, authority. Uh, but uh, I, I read an interview of a Belarusian pagan who said that they had tried to have a ritual where they were they used as a sacred script some lyrics from this band, so that mm -hmm. <laughs> there's, there's something about the importance of this music. Uh, but dividing these movements into this nature-oriented uh, parts, and on the other hand, uh, this militaristic, nationalistic, is of course uh, quite simplistic. Uh, a good example is uh, well, grand, one of the grand old men's or men of uh, Slavic state of Russian uh, Slavic paganism, uh, Dobroslav Alexander Brilov, uh, Dobrovolsky, who uh, is very uh, fascinating and controversial person, uh, because uh, on the one hand, he is a, a horrible anti Semite, he uh, has been engaged and propagated uh, Russian national, national socialism, but at the same time, uh, he's engaged in this uh, kind of deep ecology and in his writing uh, compassion is one of the central values and uh, it's uh, I once gave to my students uh, to read four pages of his writing but first in the first two pages he was talking about uh, people's connection with nature and that that human beings should not uh, cause any harm to any living being and uh, on page third he started with this very aggressive and but uh, uh, kind of uh, propaganda uh, so occasionally it is quite difficult to distinguish there and of course there are many different kind of, uh, kind of ways to to uh, to uh, combine these different elements as a pagan uh, religiosity. And then uh, kind of approaching the topic of post-colonialism and nationalism, uh, another question is whose tradition is it that these pagan groups are reviving? Uh, is it Russian tradition? Is it Belarusian tradition? Uh, or is it Sla uh, Slavic tradition? Um, some communities talk about Aryan, Aryan uh, tradition. Uh, in, and especially in Ukraine, uh, Halina Losko has said, uh, actually said that we cannot talk about Ukrainian uh, pagan tradition because Ukraine, as most scholars of nationalism would, would also confirm, is quite a recent uh, uh, construction for. for Phenomenon. Uh, Adrian Ivaki actually argues that the reason why in Ukraine this area, third area tradition, is was used so often, especially in the 1990s, was that this uh, idea of Slavic tradition of, often contained this uh, Russocentric uh, connotations. Uh, the idea that Slavs are one united nation in this way, kind of. Um, diminishing the Ukrainian aspect there. Uh, but then uh, what is uh, our tradition? Uh, Belarusia is, is a, a very interesting case here uh, because uh, already in the 19th, uh, 19th century, the theory about pre, uh, previous as a, as a kind of uh, pride that uh, are, are the, uh, form the foundation for the Belarusian tradition uh, gained popularity, even though that this pride was populated uh, actually only at very limited space in, in Belarusia. Uh, but in the 1960s, uh, some scholars suggested that this pride was actually not Slavic, that was it. And in contemporary Belarusian uh, paganism, uh, 
this division into those who subscribe to the idea that uh, Belarusian paganism, Belarusian nation is actually uh, Baltic, uh, and those who argue that it's Slavic, uh, mm -hmm. they are kind of having constant debates. Um, and then, uh, is it uh, Russian tradition, is it Slavic tradition, mm -hmm. or is it a local tradition? And uh, Raman Shrivensky has made surveys within pagans and uh, noticed that actually often this local uh, tradition may be more important than, than this, this uh, national uh, context or, or formulation. So moving on to these colonial experiences, uh, Again, we have to start from the 19th century, and, and Fyodor Vienshu actually was, I think, was the first who uh, discussed this post colonialism and, and contemporary paganism. Uh, also, mentioned this, uh, uh, I, think, I think actually it's eight, already 18th century uh, othering of the Eastern Europe, uh, Europe Orientale, uh, and, and the way that. Uh, Slavic areas are often depicted in, in Western discourses. Um, but talking about kind of internal, uh, within internal experiences in these Slavic areas, uh, in 19th century discussions about Slavic identity, these tensions between Slavophilism and on the other hand, this Russia-centric Panslavism also had their impact on, on how, how it was constructed. Mm -hmm. um, and then during the Soviet times, uh, the boom of manner for, for developing national identities was, was, of course, limited. And especially in the discussion in Belarus between pagans about how much uh, Belarusian identity uh, was allowed to be developed, uh, they, they are conducting these discussions. Uh, in contemporary, uh, in post-Soviet uh, world, these groups of centrism, the, the impact of the Russian paganism is a constant, is a constant topic of discussion, especially in the Russia and Ukraine. And these Russian organization, Russian literature, they have an impact. They are read in Ukraine, and especially in the Russia. But at the same time, in both of these countries, there is a little, little kind of resistance for this uh, dominance of these Russian organization, Russian literature. Uh, mm -hmm. And then finally, this uh, paganism and politics in Russia, uh, of course, this uh, authoritarian, growing authoritarianism has an impact in pagan communities in, in Russia, but also in uh, Belarus. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you look at uh, the debates in, in, for example, in Russian media, there are these alarmist uh, exaggerating reports about uh, pagan uh, impact on uh, Ukraine mm -hmm. and, and also in the Russia, especially these pagan groupings that uh, subscribe to this Baltic theory that the Russian identity is, is basically Baltic. So there are uh, these portrayals that uh, uh, is pagans who are actually is trying to organize some kind of follow revolution in Belarus and also participating in the war and persecuting Orthodox Christians and so on. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can see actually in Belarus uh, of these organizations, uh, they have been political changes and, and they have been impacted on, on their position and uh, possibility to, to function. Uh, so to, to conclude, uh, in these countries, there are, of course, shared experiences, uh, similar developments, but also uh, many uh, differences. Uh, there is migration of ideas and, and for example, literature. Uh, and at the same time, there are differences. Like, for example, Book of Wales, uh, even though it's read in uh, both in Ukraine and Russia, uh, the reading of it differs. And uh, actually, Ukrainian pagans are criticizing the way that Russian pagans are interpreting it and criticizing it for um, being presented as again as a kind of uh, idea of, of the uh, common unified identity of, of uh, Slavs. 
uh, and these post-colonial experiences, it's uh, obvious that uh, they are very, very real in, in many countries, uh, in not only, of course, in Russia and in Ukraine, but uh, Poland and so on. Um, so trying to, uh, in a way, to avoid uh, this kind of uh, nationalist or methodological nationalism uh, in one way, it, the, on the one hand, uh, these areas do indeed have their own um, national history, national different kinds of national identities, and especially the political realities that has uh, had a uh, decisive role in their experiences, in their history. But at the same time, uh, it should be noted that when we write about, for example, paganism in Ukraine or paganism in Belarusia, uh, we have to take into account both, both in historical context and contemporary world, these transnational communities and hybrid identities that go beyond these national boundaries. Thank you. Thank you.